So we are going to talk about, you know, uh, the importance of this workshop uh, that you're going to go through for the next couple of days. And uh, uh, the focus of my talk in the first session would be on uh, basically getting acclimatized to it, what malware is and what botnet is, uh, uh, what do you call this, and the role they play in, uh, in affecting our life. Right. So before I continue, anybody can tell me what this is. It's already there. This is uh, what does it look like to you? It's ARPANET. But what is ARPANET? I'm trying to view the. Any idea? Anybody can type into the chat. I can't see the chat window. Anybody typing anything? Mm -hmm. Let me look at that more. Chat. Okay, you can see it now. Okay, what is uh, what is that? Uh, so I saw beginning of the internet. Uh, it's where the internet started. IP addresses, right? So this is so what we can say that is the prelude to the internet. The internet at an infancy back in 1977. If you can look at what how the internet looks like in back in 1977, you know. Let me see. moment I need to configure my pointer. Okay, well, I'm just setting up my tablet so that Okay. So what you can see over here, it is made out of very small number of organization like Stanford, uh, Utah, MIT, uh, it's right. Oops. ARPA, NSA, Radga, and all these things over here are the hosts that is connected to the network, all right? So if you can look at this whole uh, structure, whole network, you can see there's only about 15, 20 organizations with about with less than 100 hosts connected to the internet. Can you imagine only 100 hosts connected to the internet back in 77? At that time, these guys never thought uh, that internet will become the phenomenon it is today. You know, they thought that, you know, universities will probably use this infrastructure to do research and nobody will, it will, will ever use this for anything else. You know, it's a boring stuff and, uh, and, you know, that was the expectation. Even when they decided, you know, I, can't, I come from an IPv6 and we are responsible for uh, V6 deployment in the country. And also we have, uh, have other countries uh, with V6 training and deployment. There's always question, what happened with V4 and we had to move to V6. IPv4 is 32 bits, right? Uh, IPv6 is 128 bits. The fact that if you, many of you already know that we have run out of the IP address that we use today, IP version 4 is almost depleted or depleted at the uh, registry level. So 
when the question was asked, so I personally asked this question to Winsurf when I met him at the uh, uh, conference because he was one of the inter father of the internet. Uh, I asked him, so, sir, we, I always get this question, why did you decide on 32-bit for IPv4? Uh, he said that, you know, well, we didn't expect anyone to use the internet. So we felt that even 32 bit was a bit too large. We were thinking at the range of eight bits or 16 bits, right? We're talking about 65,000 uh, hosts at most. But we, uh, he felt that okay, never mind. Let's go ahead with 32 bit uh, and and adapt to the processing capability of computers at that time. So he never thought that internet will be the phenomenon it is today. So if he thought that it's going to be, he would have never agreed uh, or suggested 32 bits. So this is where uh, the internet was. This is where the internet is. It's to a global always on network where, where we pretty much can't survive with, with our internet nowadays, right? We spend more time online than we do offline. Uh, uh, in Malaysia, the average time spent by users per day is about average per day is six hours i don't know how it is in in the philippines uh, I, I think it should be around there but of course some of you say six hours that's too little i spend pretty much the whole day <laughs> online for work for leisure for business for uh, you know looking for information learning right so uh six hours is too little for men, many of, of us. So uh, if you look at the world population now, it's almost 8 billion. Uh, when I checked about four years ago, the number of users who have online access, access to the internet, uh, it was about 2 billion. This is four years ago. Uh, and I checked last year or a few months back, it's almost 5 billion, right? You can look at the trend of the number of users gaining access. When I say gain, have access to online, it could be partially, it could be fully connected, uh, but they have some form of internet connection and it's what it calls, the growth of on internet users has been growing exponentially over time. So that is something amazing and uh, uh, you know, remote places which you never expect to have internet connection seems to have uh, seems to be connected already. Uh, last year, we I visited my ancestry village back in India, uh, so it was pretty much middle of nowhere. And I told everybody, guys, uh, probably there's no phone line over there, no no uh, no cellular net coverage. I'll be offline for two weeks. So we went to that place and, uh, you know, I saw people with cows and goats and uh, village houses and stuff. And, uh, and for out of curiosity, I switched on my phone. I was surprised they have 4G connection in middle of nowhere, right? So I was wondering what they do with 4G connection in middle of nowhere, take photos of their cows, do selfies with their cows and goats and put it on Facebook. I have, I have no idea, but the point is that internet has uh, proliferated throughout the world, even to middle of nowhere. All right. So knowing that uh, internet being so important to the way we run our life, it is so much used uh, in the transaction, business transactions that is run. The internet economy is much bigger than all economic put together, right? Whatever we do online, the transactions transactions we do online is the, the, the size of that economy is much bigger compared to all the other economies, physical economies put together. And uh, of course, whenever there's money, wherever there's potential to take advantage of uh, 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 infrastructures that can be uh, leveraged, broken into, uh, is always 
becomes a point of interest to criminals. So now we have a new breed of criminals. We used to think that criminals are those who break into banks, steal stuff, you know, commit crimes, uh, uh, what do you call this, in the real world. But cyber criminals have become the new uh, new players when it comes to the criminal business, right? Where the number of uh, cyber crimes has been overtaking traditional crime in the past couple of years, right? So what is cyber crime? Right? What, what is cyber crime? What do you think cyber crime is? Any idea? If it was a face to face class, I'll just point at you and and uh, ask you questions. So, so I can't point at the screen. <laughs> right? So, any, any idea? Hacking, crime using the internet, bullying. All right. Any any other answer? Correct. Those are parts of the answer. Committing crime online. Right. Fraud. Yes. Identity theft. Yes. These are all very good examples of what cyber crime is. Crime where a computer is the object of the crime. Uh, okay, you can say that computer is the, 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 the tool. Exploitation, yes, okay. So there's two type, I can break, divide, divide cyber crime into two type of a crime. Child pornography, yes. So one is using the internet and computer to commit a crime. So this is uniquely unique to the tool used, which is computer and the internet, right? Because the existence of the internet and the computer, you have new types of crime, like what we have mentioned earlier, identity theft, hacking, malware, phishing attack, botnet, etc., and so on. These are unique because of this technology. But cybercrime is also facilitation of traditional crime using the computer and the internet. Stalking, stealing information, pornography, cyberbullying, human trafficking, etc., and so on. So I have one question to you. Uh, well, in... Uh, in Malaysia, pornography is also, uh, owning pornography is also a crime, not just child pornography. How is it in Philippines? It also could be a learning experience for me. No one wants to answer. Everybody's scared to answer. Huh? <laughs> what is the... How does the law govern when it comes to pornography and child pornography, online pornography, online child pornography in Philippines? Everybody's very quiet. Okay. In Malaysia, owning pornography, even whether disregard of whether child or not, is a crime. All right. The caveat is you must, if you own, for example, if you download pornographic content, uh, so you have anti-child pornography law, correct. But do you have anti-pornography law? True. There seems to be a spike. I mean, uh, there's a uh, study that being carried out, which I'm looking at also. Uh, where this, when it comes to child pornography, exploit, even uh, uh, bullying has been on the growth uh, during this time. So somebody pasted the actual, okay, if you can look at the chat, that's very interesting. 
approved uh, 2012 uh, mm -hmm, uh, legal issues concerning online interactions and the internet in the Philippines. Among the cyber crime offenses included in the bill are cyber squatting, cyber sex, child pornography, identity, identity theft, illegal access to data and libel. Pretty similar, but we are a bit stricter uh, uh, here. Even pornography, is, owning pornography is a crime. But the caveat is, if you stream pornography content, that is not a crime. If you own, for example, if you download and save it into your hard drive, that is a crime. So uh, there is a caveat over the, the law that we have. All right, interesting. Thank you for sharing. So we have learned something new today. Uh, so there's so many things we can talk about when it comes to cybercrime, but uh, for the sake of our workshop today, I'll just focus on malware and botnet and uh, uh, what do you call this? I do talk about the other topics in other talks uh, because uh, I'm also involved in the Malaysian Crime Prevention Foundation of Malaysia and we look at uh, all the other issues. I work with the drug uh, administration uh, of Malaysia, how internet facilitates drug uh, trafficking, uh, human uh, with other organization on human trafficking. So uh, these are actually very interesting stuff. Uh, uh, a lot of, uh, you'll be surprised to see how internet accelerate some of these crimes. Uh, so anyway, uh, let me just continue or else I'll be continuing, continue talking on, and diverge from our main topic today. All right, so let me just go back here. What is malware? I know you can always Google and find the answer, but what's what comes to your mind? when you talk about malware, malicious software. Why don't we use the term virus anymore? Okay, so Fernando said virus. Why don't we call, use the term virus, pop-ups, all right? So the reason is that virus, uh, okay, cyber attack, uh, one of the actions carried out by malware is cyber attack. Could be DDoS, could be penetration, uh, taking advantage vulnerability, right? Bringing down infrastructure, right? So that although cyber attack is the effect of malware, right? Malware is basically, uh, as, you, as Christian said, uh, mentioned malicious software. So it's a group of software that basically covers, you know, any software that has malicious intent, virus, pop-ups, worm, bots, Trojan. So there's so many terminologies doing different type of damages, right? So all these type of software that uh, that causes damage intentionally was designed to cause damage or designed to take advantage of your vulnerability. Uh, let me admit this person. All right, it's called, this group of software is called malicious software, thus short form is malware. Botnet is a type of malware, right? So we'll deep dive into this uh, uh, in a moment. Uh, so let's go. Uh, what do you call this? More detail. So, so I don't have to admit admit those new participants who are coming, right? So I don't have to click keep click admitting. I just leave it. Uh, I just click on this. Okay. Okay. So let me continue. So, why do you think the cyber crime? is on the rise and is overtaking traditional crime in many parts of the world. Why? Okay, let me ask you a question differently. Why? Do you see 
Yep. Many people are using are using the internet as increasing. Yes. So one of the appeal is because internet is very, very powerful infrastructure used by almost everybody, every business, blah, 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 and so on. Okay, internet has no boundaries, correct. Internet uh, access a free lab, okay, correct. So uh, I'm looking for that one, one answer. Why do, we, do, we, do you think that, you know, you have so many keyboard warriors out there, right? Everybody has an opinion to say, you know, every time, uh, for, for information, I left social media eight years ago. Uh, the only social media account I have is on Twitter because, you know, every time I make complaint to the authorities through uh, email or letter or any other type of platform, nobody respond, re replies. If I complain on Twitter, I get immediate response. Uh, here, sir, how can we help you, right? That's the only reason I have uh, a Twitter account, but otherwise I'm completely disconnected from social media because everybody has an opinion. Everybody has to say something. Everybody is a keyboard warrior. But if you bring these people into a physical room and ask them to say what they said online, do you think they would say it? I don't think so. Why are you brave enough to say it when you're online and not when you're in person? Yes, Khalil. So I've seen a lot of answers. They are all correct. But the main reason or main uh, reason or appeal of cybercrime is if you look at Anonymity. Sorry for my uh, a very bad drawn line. Anonymity and also it is distributed in nature. Right. And also, second reason, many countries have very few laws. Only in the past couple of years, we have seen laws being uh, being formed to address uh, laws pertaining to the cyberspace. You know, traditional law does not apply to many part of uh, the crimes committed online. Uh, let me give you an example. I have my access point, my Wi-Fi, right? Uh, installed and uh, I did not configure any security, no WPA, WPA2, no, no security at all. It's open, right? Fine. So my neighbor seriously needs to access the internet. He did not pay his internet bill. He scans for access points, finds my access point, which is open. So he connects to my access point and does his stuff, right? Pays bills, goes to Facebook, uh post images on instagram and so on and so forth did he commit a crime so if somebody have used your access point where your access your wi-fi is open is it a crime i mean say to be incognito what, what, what do you mean by to be incognito on your browser Okay, the question is, I have my Wi-Fi open, someone else have scanned for my wife for the Wi-Fi, found my Wi-Fi to be connected to my access point and started using the internet. Is it what my neighbor has committed? Is it a crime? <laughs> yes, with a <the> question mark. <laughs> well, Let's be honest, all of us have done that before. I have done that before. I'll scan for wherever I go those days, you know, before mobile data became uh, very cheap, right? Uh, we all connect, look for free Wi-Fi access and connect to it and so on. Uh, 
two things you need to look at. One, you need to ask question, why is it free? It could be, you know, cyber criminals just setting up access points and looking at your communication and trying to do a look for vulnerability on your machine, right? Second is it could be legitimate, right? Somebody's uh, actual Wi-Fi, but as uh, Khalil has put it, you probably connect are connecting without permission, right? If you ask you the same question, if I'm at not at home, I leave my house, the door to my home open, does it give you a right? So you, you look at my house, oh, the door is open. So I just walk into my house, open my refrigerator, eat my food, uh, sit on my couch, watch TV, uh, you know, take shower in my house. Can you do that? You can't do that. that that's a crime. You're breaking into other people's property. It's the same issue with Wi-Fi. You cannot connect to any open Wi-Fi without permission, right? It's a crime. Of course, different countries look at it differently. If you look at in in Malaysia, we are, you know, nobody will entertain if you go and make a police report, this guy connected to my Wi-Fi without my permission. The question we will ask is that, why didn't you put any uh, access restriction to your Wi-Fi? But if you go to countries like Singapore, if somebody complains that, you know, and has evidence that this person have used my Wi-Fi, open Wi-Fi to connect to the internet, you can be charged, right? So be careful when you go to different countries, look for a free Wi-Fi, oh, it's open, let me connect to it. No, different countries have different level of laws in handling cyber crimes. Right, you can actually unmute your mic if you want to ask questions. Uh, let's not make it that only I'm talking, you know, throughout the session. Normally face-to-face, -face, there'll be a lot of discussion going on. I know it's a bit awkward uh, doing online. Let's, uh, we are, uh, let's do our best to make it uh, interactive. Uh, okay, so let me continue. So these are some of the issues those days. Uh, Lovebug virus came from the Philippines. Is it true? Anybody from that era? <laughs> I mean, that shows that you know you have good hackers in Philippines, right? Good malware writers in Philippines. So no, it's not sadly true. It's good that it is true, right? So uh, it will basically create more. You see, whenever I give classes or tutorials or talks on on uh, cybersecurity, everybody is interested in becoming hacker. That's, that's what's there on their mind. It is good because, you know, we need more coders. We need good coders. How do you become a good coders? By become a good hacker. Because, uh, you know, you, you need to understand how the network works. You need to understand how to write codes. Uh, you need to understand how to make the code as small as possible so that it is not traced, right? You can become ethical hacker. Most of our hacking class is about ethical hacking. You need to think like the, the criminal in order to identify the criminal or criminal intent or malware and so on. So the only way to do that is to be one, right? And honestly, there is no real ethical hacker. We, you know, we always say we have the white hat and the black hat. White hat is the good guy, ethical hackers. Black hat are the bad guys who always break into system uh, to steal information or put malware inside. Most of us are gray hackers, uh, gray hats. We do good stuff, but sometimes you also take advantage of this good stuff to commit some, you know, the black stuff, the bad stuff, right? So most hackers, uh, there is no truly white hacker, there's gray, white hat, there's gray hat, right? Of course, there's many categories of blue hat, uh, green hat, red hat, so many categories of hats. But, uh, you know, that's a different class. That's where I talk about cyber crime in, in entirety, right? We'll talk about uh, many, many aspects of cyber crime. Yeah, I, I heard about uh, Guzman. Yeah, so he was very popular back in uh, two decades ago, right? 
So uh, we will try a, probably, you know, is there any follow up to love bug virus or something? Corona bug virus from Philippines, new one. So you become famous again. I have no idea whether it's working with the US, but the interesting fact is that most hackers who are caught in US for hacking are given job in their, in government, right? But if you do that in country like Malaysia, if you get caught, you go to jail, right? So it depends on where you commit the crime. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, also increasing growth of e-commerce and social media. How many of you are on Facebook? Uh, sorry, stupid question. How many of you are, are not on Facebook? Uh, is there any race fan, fan function? Anyone who's not on FB? <laughs> Uh, Samuel Sandin, not, I'm not so sure, I can't recall the name. You know, you remember the the one who, the hacker are normally the heroes compared to the one who caught him. Fernando is always on FB, guy. Fernando, please get a life. Go see real friends, right? F FB is no good for you. I'm telling you, it has become from a knowledge sharing platform to hate sharing platform, All right? Okay, then I'll keep quiet, chat. <laughs> I don't want to rub it authorities, officials. Okay, let's continue you know, appeal. Nobody on the internet, nobody knows you're a cat. Uh, it used to be on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. It used to be a dog picture. But you know, Malaysia is an Islamic country, so I need to respect uh, my Muslim friends, so I changed dog to cat, right? So, uh, so please, uh, so what are you at the end of the day on, on the internet? When you go online, what are you, how are you identified? Any idea? When I connect to google.com, does a Google server see or server is connected to google.com? What does the server see? Post. email all host oh, you are pretty much known with your ip address yep ip you may have many many email or you can even create fake email addresses the only ip address that is uh, truly tied to you is your ip address true Not entirely true. Most of the times, yes, but there is always way to work around it. Have you guys heard of Tor Network? Let me share that. Uh, so those of you who know what is Tor Network, um, let me try to share that. Okay, before that, let me just clarify that uh, this is only for educational purpose. If you de decide to use it for any malicious intent, please do not quote me. Okay, if you get into trouble, you're on your own. Right, this is on recording, huh? so it's good. Let me share this new share. So can you see the, the the website that I'm sharing? 
it's not really dark web, right? Dark web, you, web is something you need to be invited to. I'm part of number of dark web and dark net societies where we talk about, you know, dark stuff. I can, I can tell you, right? So you can actually download a browser specific to your platform. What this Tor network does is that this browser does is that it creates a virtual circuit over your existing internet connection. And, and uh, what do you call this? And this browser have nodes all around the world where it will connect to these nodes. And one of the end nodes will then make the actual connection. So I won't go into details. So basically when you check your IP address by using this browser, it may show IP address from Germany, it may show IP address from France, from Singapore, from Malaysia. It's not tied to your ISP, right? This is the only way to be truly anonymous, right? Without this, you can be easily traced if they want to, right? Uh, it's it's not difficult. It takes effort to trace someone if you're not using Tor. But if they somebody if you if authorities if you have said something really bad about somebody important, they can really put effort trace you by talking to your ISP, which can easily trace who connected to uh, this server at what time uh, and which account is used. To circumvent that, you can always use Tor browser to be truly anonymous. Please do not use this for, now, if you do use this, I cannot tell you not to use it. If you do use it, do not quote my name. This is for your information. I would suggest do not use it. Of course, you know, when you use this browser, the connection will be very, very slow because it's routed over for volunteer nodes all around the world. You can read more about it. Uh, let me go back to my, Screen, let me share it again. Okay. So let's talk about, you know, the early years of the malware. The first ever malware or, you know, what we call virus was not meant to be a virus. It was an experiment that was designed to see how a program can replicate itself and move between computers over the network uh, back in 71. Remember, we still have ARPANET, still had ARPANET at that time, right? So that was called Creeper. Then in 74, Webit, it's a self-replicating program. It makes multiple copies of it until it makes multiple. So it spins off process upon process upon process on the, on the computer until the computer is saturated. You can say this is an early day or ancient DOS attack, right? It saturates your computer with so much uh, copies of itself, the computer becomes uh, unusable. So every time you boot it up, It'll just spin off. The first thing you'll do is spin off uh, copies of itself and your computer jams. It's called Rabbit because, you know, that's what rabbits do. They reproduce you know, and they get out of hand, right? Ad Cloner was written by a 15-year-old boy, right? Uh, it's one of the most publicly known uh, virus that, you, that has infected computers uh, specifically IBM PCs back in early 80s. And uh, 86, Brain Boot Sector Virus. This is, uh, has a, I have a personal attachment to this virus because this is my first experience with virus. You, anybody come from the MS-DOS era? There's a chat. Uh, Christian from MS DOS era. Did you start with uh, three point something or where, when did you start? Two point something. So Christian, you must be like late forties, right? 
it's not answering. <laughs> yes. So nowadays I don't ask for age. Do you know? Have you used MS DOS? Yes, you're late for this. Have you seen an eight, ten, eight inch, uh, eight inch floppy drive? Uh, yes. Then you must be fifty plus. Chernobyl virus. Yeah, somebody want to say something? No. Okay. Chernobyl. Yes, it is uh, also popular, but you know. It is the, the public, or how should I say, the media attention was much more on the ones I've listed. There's many more viruses uh, out there, actually. So these are some of the viruses that actually became notorious compared to uh, Chernobyl. I, I think Chernobyl was what, the early 2000s or late 90s? I can't remember. Okay, so. So this is what happens when brain boot, you, your floppy disk. Uh, many of you, if you're uh, 30 years or below, you may not know what is floppy disk. I think Christian and I know what floppy disk is all about. So we used to share floppy disk, you know, just like you, you, you guys share USB sticks. Our floppy disk was 360 kilobytes. Right? We have to swap disks to run programs. While you're playing game, insert disc too. You insert this. So we'll be spending more time swapping disc than playing game, right? So this is basically the first wire experience I had with virus. It's called brain boot sector. Uh, you know, normally when you boot from your floppy disk, you use MS DOS. It goes to a prompt like your DOS command console in your Windows, right? That's it. That's our operating system: a black screen with a prompt. When you are infected with this virus. When you boot your computer, this image will appear first before it goes into the command prompt or boots into the operating system. Or at least that's what, you, what it wants you to think. Actually, whatever you do on the computer will not work. You have to reboot with alternate, uh, control alternate F5 to get to the actual operating system. So this is actually written for fun. It does not do real damage, but it was done for fun. Uh, then 86, we had uh, PC Wright Trojan, 88 Morris worm, right? The first uh, virus or malware to infect over the network, right? And 1991, another, my personal favorite, Michelangelo. Uh, this virus basically zeroes all office document and it only works on March 6th, right? So this is a news that came out about uh, Michelangelo virus. Oh, this get error ML, all right. You must be late 40s too, early 40s. Okay, so Michelangelo computer virus hits, but term a dot, but the thing is that people uh, or researchers found about this virus and they said, okay, this is what you should do. We have not found the, uh, how should I say, the cure or the, the removal capability for it as we are studying it. So what they have suggested is that do not switch on your computers on 6th of March because 6th of March is where the virus will hit and because 6th of March is the day birth date of Michelangelo. Michelangelo, the, the, the what do you call it, Renaissance artist, not the turtle, right? Uh, so everybody listened to this. So everybody went offline on sixth, at least in Malaysia. Uh, in some countries, they were able to uh, remove it because they already found the solution. Remember those days, internet was like, what, what is internet? What is that? Is that like you know, new type of phishing net or something, right? So that's how we looked at internet those days. So to get the, the fix to, to the rest of the world would have taken time. So the only way we have uh, alleviated the attack from this virus is go offline on 6th of March, all right? You can work on 5th, Chuti, or <laughs> Chuti is by BM for go on leave on 6th and 7th, come back. Right, and then wait for the fix to come. So that's how we have able to 
alleviate the attack from Michelangelo virus, right? But I was, I was uh, doing my assignment at that time. Unfortunately, I didn't bother about the virus at that time. I continued working on 6th of March. I had spent a couple of weeks working on my assignment. On 7th of March, my Word document was zero bits. All gone. I was depressed for a few days before I got back to work, right? And Melissa virus generally acknowledges the first mass email virus, Melissa utilized Outlook. So <clears throat> Melissa infects Outlook. Then, you know, those days Outlook, all Office products run on VB script. So you can actually write a VB script, a VBS file, and then attach it to an email. Say, I have an attachment, an important document for you. You click on it. It's actually a VB script, which uh, installs itself into Outlook client. And, and then this script will then self, uh, whenever you launch, it will scan your address book, look for emails, and then send the same message, message over again to those in your address book, right? Anybody still using uh, Outlook for checking or for, as your email client? No one? The best is to go web-based. Uh, I typically use Gmail and pop all my emails over there. Uh, I'm, I'm not selling Gmail. I mean, use their free service. Uh, and uh, it has very good scanner that will remove uh, emails with malicious attachment. So, so I don't have to worry about uh, infected emails. Okay, in, in the new millennia, in last decade, we had new type of viruses coming up, right? Uh, for one, I love you worm. It's called I love you because, you know, some, if you receive an email from uh, someone, someone uh, from the opposite gender, and subject says, I love you, what would you do? Guys or ladies, if you receive an email with an attachment, I love you from, from a, a guy, right? What would you do? What would we have done at that time? Yes. Oh, so did you click on it, Emil? Were you curious to find out who, uh, who loved you so much? <laughs> that's good that you know uh, that you know many of us have been victims i've been victim you've been victim right uh this is the first case of what we call social engineering right this is typically what you would have received right so love letter, see attach file, love letter for you. What would you do, right? I'm curious, I'm not saying that, you know, I want to get into relationship with this person. Of course, something is wrong if you received an email, you're a guy and you received an I love you email from another guy, that's something is wrong. But if it's from a, a gender to the opposite gender, then you are curious, right? You want to click on it. Emil, what happened when you clicked on the attachment? Blank screen, yep. Nothing pops up because, you know, it just shows up a blank screen because it's, it has installed itself, the script into your uh, Outlook client, all right? Of course, you know, Outlook has evolved. Uh, it is more secure now. I would still not trust it uh, with my, uh, what do you call this, with my emails. I'm, I go fully web-based, right? Uh, I, if Gmail wants to look at my emails, go ahead, but not criminals, right? So uh, I pop everything on Gmail. It is scanned, spams are removed, malwares are removed, it's safer and I, Microsoft cannot guarantee. If you look at a site called CVE, Common Vulnerability and Exposure, 
you can still find a lot of vulnerability in Outlook that pops up from time to time. So it's not entirely uh, secure. Nobody can guarantee that anything is 100% secure. You know, there's always there's zero day vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities that exist in all systems and applications, just that it is not discovered yet. Most of the security patches and solutions are reactive. Somebody finds the issue, somebody reports it, then Microsoft, whoever takes steps to address that issue. There could be hundreds or thousands of issues uh, hiding to be discovered. Right? So we have many types of uh, similar network driven or email or online driven viruses. Anna Kornikova virus. This email says, oh, I have pretty pictures uh, of Anna Kornikova. Do you want to check it out? Right? Once again, you're curious. Click on it and you get infected. Slammer infects uh, MS SQL servers, right? Kerber virus, uh, uh, what do you call this? It is one of the first mobile, uh, we are talking about, what do you call this? I forgot the operating system back in Nokia time. What was it, anybody can remember? Starts with S. Mm, nobody remembers. Anyway, uh, CBM, right. So that's one of the first virus. Kuface is Facebook virus uh, that propagates to uh, Facebook social network sites. And Configa is a worm that, uh, what do you call this? Cost network damages to servers and so on back in 2008. And this decade, we have moved to a more complex, you know, people started with writing wires for fun, right, then Zuko, then they have said, right, I need more attention, I want to cause damage. I saw had a motorbike going by. Okay. <clears throat> so, we have moved to the era of uh, uh, what do you call this? I used to do it for fun. I used to cause damage. I used to get, uh, like to get mentioned. My virus get mentioned in media all over the world. Okay, so I'm bored. The hackers uh, or cyber criminals have said, okay, fun time is over. Now let's uh, look at how to monetize our skills. So 2010 and beyond is all about using malware to make money. Right, 2010 saw Stuxnet. Stuxnet is <clears throat> considered one of the most dangerous, uh, not just uh, money making, also political propaganda, uh, what do you call this, uh, and so on, right? There, has, there is a goal that they want to achieve. It could be uh, financial, political, social, and so on. So Stuxnet back in 2010 was the beginning of the botnet era. Stuxnet was recognized for its danger of infecting nuclear warheads, right? In Iran, everybody uses Windows. And Windows is, I hope nobody is using, yep, in Israel nuclear facility, right? Anybody still using Windows XP? Or Windows 7? No one? All Windows 10? Oh. Okay, just uh, before that, I would like to declare myself as an anti-Apple person. <laughs> I'm not a fan of Apple products. Anybody who uses Apple, even my family, are not allowed to enter my home if you have an Apple product. Right? Lucky we are all online. Or else, you know, I would ask, force you to raise your hand. Who is the Apple uh, Apple users? <clears throat> anyway, generals, uh, 
military all used windows software right so you are in war with us but you use us uh, christian good i am more of a linux user uh, but for you know workshops and all that i still need to use powerpoint uh, i'm moving away from powerpoint i'm moving going moving to uh, google uh, present and things like that so i would recommend if anybody who's not and also the other reason i have windows is i'm a gamer so uh, gamers games are not written for linux so i got no choice so as and that for work please move to linux linux is pretty stable right a lot of things that you want to do uh please uh, try google docs or uh, google services or move to linux right i i more on ubuntu variant but you can try anything else but that's my recommendation anyway so that's my problem i like to you know when there's something come pops up i'll try I like to deviate and talk about this stuff sorry about that okay so uh so you see it's already one hour i've still not gone into botnet yet i just started so uh okay 2010 stacks networm zeus trojan is also uh something that is a uh, prelude to botnet crypto locker ransomware 2014 back off in fact post systems 2016 server 2017 wanna cry how many of you have been infected with wanna cry before nobody okay now one real story i have with wanna cry is i uh, i'm located or my university is located in a in a state called penang in, in malaysia penang is kind of a, a mini silicon valley where major mncs have their presence here intel amd western digital uh, micron uh, major semiconductor uh, oems and uh, outsource <coughs> uh, uh, companies are located uh, in penang so we do i do a lot of consultancy in terms of uh, industry 4.0 factory automation and also security uh, one of the cases of vanakrai that affected uh, one of the major companies in penang is where uh, this company has uh, decided to upgrade uh, facility for their supervisors these are in uh, low level technicians who manage operators in production floor and so on so they give laptops to all supervisors which you can take back and uh, you, of course you need to use vpn to connect to your uh, corporate network fine so this person uh, uh, took back the laptop you know kids got excited with the laptop and she she gave it to them the kids played with it uh, and she the next day she brought it back to office connected to the network and couple of hours later a uh, message starts popping up yeah i think if you uh, have experience with wanna cry let me open this image Okay, let me share this. Uh, let me share. <coughs> Have you seen this before? This is what WannaCry ran, uh, virus or malware looks like. It pops up this message. What it does is encrypts. Uh, well, unfortunately. this company was using entirely windows services windows server windows operating system uh, windows uh, database everything windows and this malware the wanna cry ransomware encrypted everything on servers on on users uh, computers everything because 
they, what this malware does is that it scans for Samba port all over the network. It will scan for this particular port. Once the port is found open, it can easily uh, inject the malware into the computer and execute itself. Right? Microsoft did not know that this malware uh, vulnerability existed. Right? Nobody knew zero day vulnerability. Right? So production came to a halt. They can't do anything. You know, they need to look up parts so that production can be continued. You cannot because the server is locked. Right? So for them to gain access back to the, the servers, the computers, and so on, they need to pay ransom. Hey, if you want access to your computer back, you need to pay this much of amount and uh, we will send you the key or the software will generate the key for you or show the uh, decrypt key. So they had to pay. So how do you think they paid? They paid $300 and they transferred to the owner of the ransomware, uh, owner of the ransomware. So they transferred to the ransomware's bank account, correct? Do you think uh, if you ask anyone to pay ransom, hey, please transfer to my bank account, okay? Right? Does that sound a bit stupid? I don't think they would ask you to transfer to their bank account. So it's easily traceable. So what would be the best way to get the payment without them knowing who, I, uh, who the owner is? Yes, yes, Asher, you use Bitcoin. If you look at the image I'm sharing, you see down there, Bitcoin accepted here. Please pay, send $300 worth of Bitcoin to this address, All right? So you have to copy, paste, and then it will give you a, a transaction ID, right? Then you can click on check payment, paste it over there, approve, then you can click the decrypt button. All right. So the company I'm talking about, this is I'm talking about decrypting every single host. This company had to pay almost $8 million for each computer. Did they get access back to their servers and computers? I don't know. Technically, uh, we have actually uh, run this uh, crypto locker in our network, a closed network in our malware testbed. We, we tried, well, of course, we did not pay $300. We uh, reverse engineered the code and looked at it. And uh, we found that it does actually uh, decrypt your files it, because there is some behavior where a transaction uh, online happens to check whether the payment is done, communication to uh, the, the Bitcoin uh, network is done, and also there seems to be code to decrypt. Of course, uh, uh, this, uh, this malware is no longer active because they made millions and millions of dollars. The owner of this ransomware has retired. All right, so now it has been made open source. Anybody can download and write your own new ransomware. If anybody has planned to become a millionaire fast, you can get access to free open source of version of WannaCry. You can modify it. You can uh, then restart <laughs> the cycle all over again, all right? Once again, this is for your knowledge. Huh? I'm not asking you to do it. This is hypothetical. Uh, example. Now, anybody can get the source code and modify it. If you have background in coding, you can modify the code, make it more, uh, more impervious to detection, impervious to uh, what it take down, and you can make more money out of it in, in Bitcoin, obviously. Uh, somebody has actually taken the source code and came up with a more robust in about many years back. Uh, it's called Petya, P-E-T-Y-A, right? Is a variant of WannaCry. They also became millionaire. Now even Petya is open source. So nobody has gone beyond that yet. 
right? So don't try this at home, please. Okay. So uh, you can go to a website called avtest-test.org where they will publish uh, data collected on malware that has been found detected by uh, various anti-malware anti uh, companies. So you can see that the growth has been pretty, uh, how should I say, consistent over the years. Right? If you look at from 2000 to 2020, the growth has been pretty consistent. And in, in within 2020, this is how the growth has been so far. You can get these stats from avtest.org, interesting stuff they have. They also have details on uh, Android, PUAs, iOS, and so on and so forth. Anyone think who thinks that iOS is secure, it's not secure, it's secure because it is very closed, right? If I put uh, everything behind uh, a bar in, in a prison, it will be definitely be secure, right? But you won't have accessibility, usability comparatively to others. I know Apple fans will be will hate me now. It's okay, right? So my question is, why if with so many mechanisms, so many tools, so many anti-malware technologies and all that, we don't see a drop in malware being introduced. The rate of infection, now this is not number of unique malware, I'm talking about total infection, right? We're talking about it's in billions, why? Okay, Asher, humans are the weakest link, in my opinion. Okay. The problem is not with technology. As Asher said, we are the problem. The organic part of the whole system, the human, is the biggest problem when it comes to security. We can be tricked. We can be manipulated. This action is called social engineering. I think you would have heard of social engineering. I don't know. Some student asked me, sir, is social engineering about, uh, is about building social network? And I was like, okay, I have to go in depth explaining what social engineering is. So social engineering is nothing new. Social engineering is, is actually a part of human psychology study where you, know, you trick or influence others to give what you want. Uh, my son's uh, always social, uh, what do you call this? Career social engineering attack on me where you know, they said that uh, PS5 is out. And I said, no. You guys already have PCs and laptops. You guys even have phones. But that, you know, my friends have PS5. You know, there are new cool games I cannot play on PC. Uh, and, uh, you know, they look very sad. And I look at them when I feel like, no. Okay, I, I think I'll get you guys a PS5, but wait a couple of man months. Let's see what the... A review is like, and probably early January 21, I'll get you a PS5 console, right? So I was social engineered by them and they got what they want. So that is a very basic example of social engineering. And this is widely used by cyber criminals to uh, do the same, to get what they want by hacking the user because it's getting difficult to hack the system, right? Now we look at the weakest link, which is the human, the users. Yeah, they are stupid. We are all stupid, right? Why we are stupid? Because 
we give in to all these vices. We call it the seven deadly social engineering vices. Curiosity. You know, for example, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the I love you bug is the first case or the earlier case of social engineering attack. Who this person that loves me so much? I'm curious, I'm so lonely. I want to click and find out, get into a relationship, you know, click on it. You get into a relationship, of course, a relationship with a, with a virus, right? Courtesy, you know, uh, you want to uh, oblige, right? Gullible, right? Everybody knows you're, you know, as human, we are gullible to a certain extent, uh, get easily tricked, right? You, you believe easily, greed. Somebody says you want a million dollars. Really? You're going to click on that, right? Thoughtlessness, shyness, you don't want to check with anyone. Hey, should I? Uh, a lot of people click on it because they're not sure and they don't want to ask. Because they ask, they feel that uh, they'll be ridiculed. Of course, somebody, is, uh, if my kids come and ask me, uh, that should I reply to this email? I, I would make fun of him. So makes sense. Apathy, uh, don't care. We'll just want to do it. Let's see what happens, man. Well, life is short, right? So uh, most of the time, uh, they take advantage of gullibility and greed. These are the two major uh, vices or, or human psyche that used by criminals to hack you quote unquote, hack you and get their malware into the system. How many of you use torrent to download stuff? I do use torrent for research purpose. Uh, Asha uses, yes, Linux distros, yeah, right. Who else use uh, torrent to allow, download Linux distros? Who else use Torrent to download uh, open source software? How is piracy in Philippines? Do you, in Malaysia, we used to have uh, pirated DVD store in malls. Do you have, do you have in, in the Philippines? When I was in Manila, when was it last year? Uh, yeah, I saw, what was the biggest mall in in in, uh, in Manila? I forgot the name. I was there last year. Uh, a mall of Asia, yes. I didn't find any illegal outlets, illegal DVDs outlets. So I was wondering whether you know, the same same in Malaysia. We don't have pirated DVD outlets anymore. Everybody has piracy has gone online, right? Uh, I still find pirated DVDs in India, in Thailand, in Indonesia, uh, Philippines, I didn't see. Uh, maybe, you know, I was there for a short while, I didn't see. So, uh, what do you call this? Why, when you download software from illegal sites or torrent sites, why do you think anybody want to put, buy a, an original software, crack it for you, and package it for you and put it online for you so that you download, install, and here this person, I have contributed to society. I have helped people to use the software for free. Is that the case? That's not the case. Yes, they'll get the software. Yes, they'll pay for it and they will embed their malware into the installer, crack it, install their malware into whatever software you are of interest and put it on torrent or an illegal site. You will download it. When you download it, when you launch, you'll see an interface with a techno music playing in the background. Have you seen that? You know, when you run crack and all those things, yeah, Razor, for example, there'll be techno music running you know, while they're installing, they said, the guy, Please listen to this nice music while I install your software and also my malware in the background, right? So it's, it's uh, uh, you know, win-win situation. You get your software for free 
and I get to put my malware on your machine and take advantage of resources on your machine now, right? I forgot to mention earlier. Now malwares are used no longer for ransomware. Well, the, for the example I'm talking about now, malwares will get installed and they will sit there quietly, do nothing. And when they find out that the computer is idle, they say, okay, this guy is not using the computer. I will now use your computer resource to do Bitcoin mining. So your CPU resource will go up and the moment you move your mouse, poof, it will drop as though nothing happened. So you won't even know you have a malware running on your computer. Malware nowadays, you know, they go for a win-win situation, right? I don't want to cause any damage, right? You'll be happy, but I'll still uh, take it one, take you, make use of your computers when you are not using. So I'm, I'm not bothering you. Uh, that's how malwares are working nowadays, all right? So these are how, uh, one example of social engineering, right? Free software, there is no such thing as free software. There is no such thing as free lunch. Everything comes with a price, right? If it's cracked, yes, it's cracked, but potentially there is a malware. Mm, yes, Marlon. Correct. So you have already checked it out, good. So you see, you guys are also learning from our participants. YTS.MX, check it out. All right, but I, I don't download movies anymore. I stream most of them for research purpose. Okay, let's continue. Uh, I'm shoot, always shooting my time. The essence of social engineering, the bad guys always follow the path of least resistance and most profit. And, you know, any, you know, we have Air Asia, we call uh, every, anyone can fly now. If you talk about 30 years, 20 years ago, to become a hacker, to become carry out attacks, you need to have substantial knowledge of networks, substantial knowledge of uh, operating system, coding, the low level coding, we're talking about C and assembly. Now, oh, still there, hang on, sorry. Let me change the share. Mm. Oh, this is, you guys not been seeing at the screen. Uh, I mean, I've been scrolling through my PowerPoint slide, but you were staring at the uh, WannaCry ransom, uh, ransomware, right? So this is where I was, this is where I was, this is where I was, now we are here, right? So now anybody can become a hacker, right? So there are tools you can download and just click, click, click and create your own malware, right? You can configure your malware and generate uh, your own viruses, worms. You can tell you how to, so you can basically create your own botnet, right? You can download this tool that will generate, create the bot. And the only thing you need to do next is create a CNC. So we, I'll talk about this in a moment and then look at social engineering ways on how to distribute or deploy your bot, right? But creating the bot is now very, very, very easy. What is challenging is how do you social engineer uh, the internet users to get your malware into their systems, right? So it's easy nowadays to get, uh, to become a hacker, right? As you can see the, line over here shows the skill or knowledge that you require uh, to become a hacker. And this line here shows the sophistication of attacks. More people is jumping on the bandwagon to, to become a hacker and more people are carrying out more sophisticated attacks, All right? So this is also causing rise to uh, the number of malwares you see out there, but mostly social engineering. So if you look at the days of uh, COVID-19, this is what I've been observing uh, based on what I've been studying. Phishing attacks in March, I don't, didn't, they have not updated with latest uh, data. In March, you can see the number of social fish, uh, increased phishing attacks, right? This is the number of DDoS attack 
in Q1, if you can see Q1 to Q2, uh, there is in 2020, there's almost 40% increase, the, the yellow or orange. And this is my own study that I've been carrying out since March. This is called a probing attack. So what I've done is that I've set up a server, a Raspberry Pi at home, uh, which, or which has been demilitarized. You know what is demilitarization, right? When it comes to your... Uh, uh, what do you call this? Your server? What is DMZ? DMZ. Yes, demilitarized zone. What does it do? Okay, DMZ means, you know, you have uh, a router slash AP that your ISP gives you. And most of the time, you it also comes with a small firewall and uh, you, most of uh, outside users won't be able to access computers that is connected to your home router. So they cannot access. So what I have done is one of that node that is connected to this router has been DMZ, meaning that this particular host will not have any firewall protection from outside. So that means anybody can see this particular host as, as correctly mentioned by our friends in the chat. So it is exposed. All ports from one to 65,536 ports are exposed to the world. So I just left it running. I started collecting data of who's been trying to check so probing means they will check whether this particular IP is online. Well, they'll probe, they'll just do a ping. So I've been collecting this, this probing attack. It's not really attack. This is prelude to other attacks. Like, you know, once they probe, they will then collect all the IP is, uh, it's a very basic honeypotting, but I'm not doing anything. I'm just collecting IP addresses from outside. Honeypotting will also look at spin off services and see whether they, uh, what do you call this? It also goes into detail like scanning, uh, uh, what do you call this, penetration, if there's any attempt to log in. So it goes into detail. Probing is only the first step of honeypotting. So, so I only done probing. So what I've noticed is unique IPs that I've noticed in March. So I thought, you know, with pandemic, what happens? with people, probers out there. So probing can be carried out by benign, meaning that there are organizations that just scans the internet and get a map of what's happening on the internet. There are about 15, 20 organizations that do that. Uh, there are also uh, countries that carries out probing uh, activities and also hackers, attackers will start probing for vulnerable Post online. So that what they will do is they will specify range of IP addresses uh, that is been allocated around the world and they will start scanning one by one. And they look if this IP is online. If it's online, it is added to active list. If it's offline, it is added to passive list. And they will scan again all these passive lists and check whether, you know, you may go online and you may go offline, right? Some, some of some part of the day, you may switch off the router. So when you scan, you may be offline. So they will check again, all the passive uh, IPs, which has not considered down earlier and check whether it's online again. If it is, they will move it to active list. So what they do with this list is the next step is they will take all those that they found to be online. They will start uh, looking for open ports. They will see whether your port 22 SSH is open, whether your port 80 is open, whether 443 is open. Now they have, because of that, they have started look, many administrators have stopped using port 22. Uh, they started using port 2222. To they also scan this type of ports. I have those data, but I have not, uh, what do you call this, summarize them. 
So I do notice traffic is coming to 422-22, So they're also scanning non-standard ports. And from what I see is that uh, from March to, there seems to be an upward trend in number of probes that's being carried out. One of the purpose of doing this is once I know vulnerable ports, I can SSH in. If it's Windows, I look for uh, somewhere ports or whatever. I can, one of the things I can do is push my malware in. Of course, you can also use it to uh, information theft, carry out damage and all those things. But one of the other activities you can carry out is uh, injecting malware into your host. So, uh, I also have set up, uh, if you're honeypotting, one was a popular one that I've set up is to call teapot. Are you familiar with teapot? Teapot is very powerful honeypot, which can capture all kinds of probing, reconnaissance, scanning, uh, whatever attack, and it will visualize it in a very nice way. So I suggest you go and check out teapot, very interesting uh, honeypot uh, platform, but you need to have Linux running to get this uh, platform up and running, right? So these are all basically what's happening now. That's why you'll also see more malware coming out. Growth will continue happening. Okay, okay. Uh, let me just uh, get the, not that teapot, uh, this teapot. Uh, let me share this. You can get it from Git. Let me just uh, paste it over here. I don't have the exact, okay. So you can get, uh, get more information in the link I've shared on, on uh, how using teapot for honeypotting. Very powerful. If you want to capture malware, botnets and so on. Uh, Uh, when you say application in Kali Linux or what application specific? Yeah, uh, you can, okay. You can use whatever is in, if you already have, you're working on Kali Linux, you can go ahead and use what, uh, what is available there. But if you're just interested in honeypotting, you can just use teapot because your teapot is, you need to let it run for a certain number of days to collect data. I, I've been running this for almost nine months now. So uh, Kali Linux, uh, the, how should I say? The requirement is heavy, right? Because it's an ISO. What I'm running on is, uh, yeah, yeah, you can use uh, Kali Linux. As, it's a Linux distro. It has all this, uh, all attack tools, uh, analysis tool installed. It's a, it's a package. But if you want to use Kali Linux as your desktop, it's fine. There's no problem with that. If you have space, right? No issues. All right, cool. So uh, I will be rushing through. It's already 10.40. You know, I have another session. <laughs> uh, spyware, everybody knows. Uh, Trojan horse, uh, you know, uh, something that, uh, uh, behaves like a normal file, but it's actually doing something else. Virus, we have talked about it. Worm, you have talked about it. Scareware, you know, sometimes you'll see a pop-up saying that I am an antivirus. I found this many virus on your machine. If you don't click OK, consent, then your virus, your computer is not safe. Please or click OK to consent. Then what do you do? You get social engineered with fear, right? You're scared. You click okay. So what happens next? It will do a fake scan. It doesn't really do anything, but it, it installs its malware. So the interface is asking you permission to install the actual malware. It looks like a professional design and anti-malware software. It, it, it's fake. It doesn't do anything. Its sole purpose, sole purpose is to install a malware, the actual malware. All right. Adware. You know, whenever you install the uh, toolbar on browsers and all that. They say free this, free that. It will improve your internet experience. Uh, you buy into it and install adware. You get social engineered again. Ransomware, we talked about it. Now we're going to talk about bot. 
All right. <clears throat> so botnet is the next generation in when it comes to uh, malware, where botnet is also known as uh, zombie armies, right? Meaning that I write my malware and then I tell it, okay, I'm, this is what I'm going to do. Every time uh, you need to check a server every 30 minutes. Then you social engineer, get your malware into the wild, gets infected, just sits there, checks this server every 30 minutes for instruction, right? This server is web servers that has been compromised, right? Uh, we can, uh, a lot of web servers are compromised. Trust me, uh, if you scan the internet, uh, look for those running on port 80 and 443, especially those running port 80, uh, most of the time not secured. Uh, they didn't even bother, bother to put HTTP. I don't think they bothered to check any security issues. And this can be taken over and turned into a command and control uh, server by the person who wrote the bot and give the IP address or domain name to the, uh, what do you call this, uh, to the bots. Uh, what the bot does is that it will check that particular server every 30 seconds for instructions. So if I say carry out DDoS attack on this particular domain, it will check every 30 seconds, 30 minutes, it'll receive the instruction and it will carry out the instruction it received, right? If it says carry out uh, access, HTTPS access to this particular site, it will just do that uh, exactly. So imagine thousands of infected computers carrying out HTTPS requests to a particular website it will basically overwhelm the, the server being attacked because it has to service all the HTTPS requests and becomes saturated. And this will lead to what we call DDoS attack, all right? So I won't go into evolution of botnet. You can read about this, right? Uh, information theft, uh, a single information about one person can fetch up to $3 on the black market. Right, you can use bot, bot nets to collect data about the computer's user and sell it to whoever are interested in such information. Right, annual revenue of the crime that we carried out using uh, things like bot net is about 1.5 trillion dollar alone in 2019. Right, uh, so we talked about this. I won't go into details. You can read about all this. So attacking behavior, in fact, new hosts, carry out stealing information, phishing, DDoS. Where do you think all your spam emails come from? It's not somebody sitting there and sending you spam emails, right? It is sent by infected computers all around the world. That's why it's very difficult to bring down spam emails because you know you have to go to each individual infected computers and take them down for that concerted effort is gonna take a long and a lot of resources to bring uh, this kind of uh, bots uh, from continuing its, uh, its activities. So CNC, as I mentioned, right? One is centralized model, meaning that all bots talk to one CNC server, right? The disadvantage is that if the CNC is, <coughs> is down or has been removed, all this bot who are, who are told to talk to this particular server will become often. They'll be waiting forever for this server to give instruction. The server does not, it's dead, right? The parent is dead. The children are now often. There's no way they can communicate with the parent anymore. It's dead. You cannot change, come up with a new server because they have been hard coded with a particular domain name or IP address. So even, even if you find a new CNC server, all these are dead. You have to restart all your social engineering activity, right? Uh, a more resilient, more uh, stronger model of uh, uh, to circumvent uh, the issue with uh, CNC is peer to peer, meaning that you don't have one CNC within the bots. You choose uh, some of them will be nominated to become a CNC. So you have a peer to peer middle model where they are also bots, some of them are bots, they are also a CNC server. That means if one of them is taken down, the other CNC within that peer network will continue, will take over the job and they still be able to update their 
uh, CNC servers and they can still continue uh, uh, working. The problem is that uh, building a peer-to-peer -peer network is very difficult uh, to design and it's, it's, you cannot come up with a big uh, army, right? Most of the time it's very small peers, right? Like the slide shows 50, but now you can go to 200, 300, but still it's not as, you cannot go as, you cannot scale up as you would do with a centralized approach. Right, I won't go into these details. I'm already running out of time. I will share the slides. All right. Can, these are all too much details. Okay. So let me stop here. Any questions that you may have, I will share the slides. The last few slides you can read before you go to sleep. Uh, I normally don't cover that too much in detail anyway. So this is where we are when it comes to Melbourne and Botnet. And uh, botnet is now considered to be the biggest issue when it comes to cybersecurity because it is used to carry all kinds of attack, all kinds of malicious activities, and, and it can be uh, very hidden from uh, users. It takes a long time before anybody discovers it. And a lot of research we do also are in botnet. I think Dr. Shankar will also be sharing about more detail about botnet. That's why I just ran through those uh, slides specifically on peer-to-peer. -peer. So he will give, uh, his core research area is in peer-to-peer -peer botnet. So he will give more details on that. 